All right, we'll call the meeting to order. It is 605. We have a joint meeting here. Ran right top. Okay. Agenda considerations reserved for changes to agenda items. I think we're good on that one. Comments and questions from the public? All good there. All right, so we're right into the joint meeting of the Planning Commission and the Development Review Board. I'll let you take it away. I do a very quick yeah. intro. Yeah. Um, and I, I think our plan for tonight, this is very informal. If it appears that we're unprepared, it's really just that we're trying to make it as informal and comfortable for everyone as it can be. Um, so why don't we kick off with just grabbing some pizza and then Zach and I'll lead some introductions and maybe a fun little question to just get us through dinner time and then we'll kick off some more interesting questions. A little more development regulation specific. I second. That sound? <laughs> um, Zach, did you already pass out? Do you want to pass those out? So these are just talking points. I'll let Zach sort of lead them. Um, the goal, just to, to get us back to why we're here, um, and anybody who's maybe listening, if you're curious about these two boards, something important to know is that the Planning Commission helps to write the regulations. They do have to get approved by the Select Board, of course. Um, they go through public hearings, but what separates the Planning Commission from the DRB is essentially, you know, sort of that tri-stool stool of government, right? where the Planning Commission is responsible for writing regulations, the Development Review Board is tasked with implementing them when applications are brought to them. Um, and it's really critical, I think, for the two boards, the two groups, to talk because I've never, ever, ever heard of a set of regulations that were perfect. Um, they're a really living document. There's always something that we want to tweak or even it just changes because the community changes and the policies change. Um, and the commission has had a policy recently of twice a year hearing from anyone who wants to bring um, amendments to them. Sometimes they say thanks but no thanks. Sometimes they say we're going to table it until we have room. Um, and sometimes they might want to take them up right away. Uh, it's important that when these proposed changes come, they're not just coming from members of the public or the development community, uh, but they're also coming from folks um, who are very close to the DRB, who see them in action, who see, boy, this language is really problematic for X, Y, or Z reasons. It might just be that it's not very clear. Dear Planning Commission, what the heck did you mean when you wrote this? Um, or uh, we think you might have tried to say this, but it doesn't actually say that. Or you didn't contemplate this weird scenario, and this weird scenario is not so weird anymore. It happens a lot. And we're continually trying to figure out how do we use the words that we have to um, make a decision um, and what's in front of us. So what Zach has done um, you know, over the course of his time here um, and more recently is to try to listen to what these things are um, some of them are recurring, some of them are maybe just more recent, but what are the big, uh, where are the, the, the issues, where, where are things that we should talk about, where are pieces where we should let the Planning Commission know, hey, this might be something you want to look at again, or hey, can you tell us tonight what the heck this means? Um, and so we do have a list for you to work off of, I'm going to turn it over to Zach in a minute, and, um, and then of course, um, Matthew, having had a lot of experience with them, maybe can can share his insight too as to what he has seen through the years. And obviously, if there's anything that's not on this list, please feel very welcome to add to it. Our goal is not to necessarily pick apart all of them. You'll see it's a pretty long list. The goal for tonight, I think, is to highlight these and really talk about why they're on this list, why are they important for you. Where, give us some examples of where it's come up. Um, the Planning Commission then can sort of help to gauge, okay, boy, this is, this is happening a lot. Let's try to get this fixed. Um, or maybe this is a small thing, or maybe they say, boy, maybe we, we don't mean that anymore. Um, you know, it used to be that 
It was okay to build closer to the lake. I'm making this up, by the way. Um, <laughs> it was okay to build closer to the lake. We don't feel that way anymore. We know more about water quality than we ever used to. We know more about erosion than we used to, and we just don't. We've seen this, and it's very problematic. Um, so there's a wide variety of whys, I think, that are on this list. Um, what we'll try to do is um, give them the time they're due without giving them too much time. Um, you definitely don't want to rush anyone, but what I don't want to do is to, to dedicate 90 minutes to one item and never touch another. Um, so with that in mind, I'll turn it over to Zach. I'm going to play whiteboard person and timekeeper um, and maybe listener. So. Sounds good. Can you turn off your microphone? So, um, yeah, so wanted to walk through this list. This list is not a comprehensive, you know, overview of every single thing before the development review board since 2017 that needs to be updated. It's really something more recent, um, something in the last year and a half or so, um, because that's about my tenure with this town started and when I was able to get things, you know, um, just off the top of my head, went through you know all the old old agendas just to see what um, came up. You know, at least my memory. Um, hopefully, we can have a quick discussion about some of these items tonight. Um, one of the first items that comes up um, that you know you'll see on the top left hand corner is um, the Severance Corners Form Based District. Uh, this is a you know the Form Based Code District uh, for the town's uh, you know growth center area, uh, the four quadrants around Severance Corners. Um, you know, the Development Review Board now um, recently has seen a proposal for three buildings <coughs> in Sunderland, uh, which is the quadrant that's more under development right now. Um, and obviously many proposals over the years um, in the southwest quadrant. Um, I just, I'm flagging this here. I, I understand the Planning Commission is looking at, you know, the form-based standards um, to see if there's anything else that should be added or, you know, um, Clarify just to make sure that the town is really getting to see what buildings you know people want to see in that area. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to turn it over to any development review board members who might have any comments about some of these buildings uh, or what they think. I think it, one thing that I remember um, kind of standing out was the there was there's some language in there that was definitely well intended around the bump outs, right? Like we wanted the the contour of the building to have some character to it, but it, we ended up getting snookered a little bit because of the geometry of this one building where the plan proposed was definitely, or it, it seemed like it was on the money as far as the intent, but it just couldn't quite meet the, the distances that, that were spelled out specifically. And so, um, you know, I'm not, I, I am not going to advocate ever for more leeway, at, you know, at the DRB level um, in things like that. Like, I want to be able to kind of rely on something so that we can set the standard because the, the folks who are going to leverage those specific um, zoning ordinances are going to be the ones to kind of start to pick it apart and feel where the loose edges are and try and, you know, do things that um, that they want to do, um, so, but it, it is an important thing to recognize that uh, that one probably caused a, a little bit of undue agita as far as the you know back and forth with the de the designer and and the the developer and um, architects and and you know blah blah blah. And I'm not even sure how that one shook out honestly, but yeah, that one ended up going. Uh, here for that one. That one, yeah. the board ended up reopening the hearing. Oh, several, more Google than once, I want to say. Yeah. More and than once. Get the applicant to, um, you know, provide more information, revise the plans. Ultimately, they comply with the regulations. Okay. But it took a, little, yeah. it took a lot of effort to get there. Yeah. So, you know, on that one, especially this one, the form-based zoning. So I was around for this part when the, form, the idea of form-based zoning was when the growth center came in. Actually, when the growth center came in, there was a big discussion on how big it should be. I personally wanted to extend it way towards Essex and almost down to here. I thought this whole strip could have been better utilized, including the bay. 
but the state pushed us back, so we ended up with this, what you see today. So the concern was, do we get more of a downtown flavor? That was the original intent. And one of the big discussions was um, the first part gets built, and they didn't want it to look like New Jersey. I heard that a lot. We wanted more of a hands-on flavor. And then I got off the board for a minute, then I got back on the board. Now we are talking about what you see would start now. And the idea was Colchester never had a design review, but we specifically said this is the color, this is the building. But we knew what we wanted at the time. So that's how form base came about. And at that time, it, there was a flavor in how, the, how that little piece of our world should look. And we want a quality build. You know, in Colchester, we have a blank piece of paper. And somehow, I personally think, it doesn't look like what we thought originally. And somewhere in the language or what we built for the form based zoning, it doesn't look like what I heard back in the day. Somehow we missed something on that. So you had to struggle on a building to make sure where the developer, and I get it, he wants to get his bang for the buck out of the property. But somehow he came up with as tight as the rules as he could, and you guys had to discuss what we put down. And it didn't come out looking like we thought it should. At least I don't think what the board originally intended for it. And and I talked to Kathy about this before, and I was thinking about that today is a lot of times we talk about what the flavor should be in the Planning Commission, you know, our overall view of what it should look like, but then it gets up to the year guys, and the flavor kind of gets lost, and then I realized there are no ex-Planning Commissioners on the board. Hmm. And over the years, we had a lot of ex-Planning com planning Commissioners that get off yeah. and jump on your board, so at least they could discuss what they thought should be happening in the past, and then today, you know, they come up to you and you're like, eh, that's not quite what the board wanted. But you guys have to play on the rules of what we put, up, what we put down. So I think somehow there's a disconnect a little bit right there. I'm not sure yeah, yeah. exactly how to fix that at the moment. But that's what my flavor is. Yeah, and I think um, going off of that, Rich, I think, you know, really taking a look at, maybe taking a look back at the form base so we can have a discussion and say, you know, what's working? Um, what are some unintended, you know, outcomes we've seen and how can those be corrected? You know, do you want to see more color in buildings? Do you want to see more, um, do you want to see a certain type of roof on a certain type of street? You know, those are probably longer term conversations that I trust the Planning Commission will be able to, um, to have. But I think, you know, really defining that will help the DRB regardless of membership, you know, make sure that what gets proposed um, and, you know, ultimately proved and built is really what the town wants to see. Mm -hmm. um, and if I recall correctly, it was because of the intersection of a couple of different types of streets that also made the geometry of that building kind of not 100% fit quite right. And because it had, it had to be 60 feet and because the bump outs had to be every 12 or whatever, I'm, don't quote me on the math here because I'm just railing, but it's like 12 feet, the bump out of three feet, and then like by the end there was no place to put a bump out, so they were like, the whole building can't fit. Right. So it was, it, was, it was a little, it, um, but uh, yeah, it was something, just maybe revisiting some of that to just say, you know, um, it, what are some of the challenges that we've seen? What are some improvements we could make? Because it, you know, we're gonna see development on the other quadrants. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And good news, um, I think I skipped this part, I apologize. It was item B right there. Um, staff updated recent and ongoing updates to development regulations. The Planning Commission did include a look at the form based code as the very next project uh, that they'll be working on. Uh, we're finishing up right now. Sorry. <laughs> Um, the Planning Commission is currently finishing up Supplement 45, the bulk of which is related to wastewater regulations. Um, if you're not already aware, the town um, had delegation of the state's wastewater regulate the state's wastewater rules. Essentially, um, the Select Board voted to end that delegation, and that would be effective April 1st. There's a lot of tie-ins between that delegation, which exists largely in Chapter 8 of our Code of Ordinances and our development regulations. So the Planning Commission is um, shepherding that through. After the joint meeting is done tonight, they'll be talking about that and hopefully warning um, a public hearing. So that sort of snuck itself in on our list of tasks for calendar year 2023. 
Um, but the next identified task, once that supplement is wrapped up, uh, will be, I think, to take another look at the form-based code. It's sort of rated the highest among commissioners as the next big project, um, along with um, something that I don't, well, we'll, we'll see. It may actually connect to you quite a bit in the end. Um, uh, new open space plan, the open space plan that currently sits on the shelf in my office is from the year 2000. We have staff members that may not be much older than that plan. It's, it's a bit outdated. So that's also on our summer list. If you see, if you see anything on that, we encourage everyone to participate. I don't want to talk too much in advance as to what that'll produce. We want to stay very open-ended, but it may very well produce some standards that translate into the development regulations. It may also just produce some standards that say these are our high priority areas uh, for future conservation. I don't know. I don't know what it'll actually produce yet. We haven't gotten started, but it could it could run that range. Um, we'll see. Um, other pieces that are currently under review. Um, I understand that the build to, what do we call it, the zone of encroachment at the shoreline and the shoreland overlay district has been a problem. Has that just been internal? Has the board seen that as well? I don't believe. It, usually those are rebuilds that yeah. go through the building zone process. Okay. So that's something that we're also talking about as part of Supplement 45. It's the how much can you encroach closer to the lake in that shoreland 100 foot protection zone that's in the current package um, we're also talking about just how um, people who do do development um, are required to send those applications and take that burden off of staff that's it's not a very big supplement it looks like a lot but that's what we're working on now and to tie us back to form based code i think that's going to be next um, we haven't figured out exactly what that's going to look like yet, but I think it's really going to be a, you know, head to toe. Um, there are a few items that have been identified that we've heard from the board, that we've heard from applicants, that we've seen in projects that are sort of, we won't talk about them tonight, but they're currently under review, um, where the, the, the regulations just don't always, you don't think about things in advance when you write them. You don't think about those scenarios and you don't think about the actual turning radiuses. and. Um, so these things will come up. We know we now have a few examples, as Zach has said, that we can look at. Um, as soon as it gets back above 20 degrees, um, we've talked about <laughs> taking a walk. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to put that out there for anyone who wants to, to go see those buildings that are already um, under construction or almost done um, and get a closer look when you're not driving by at 35, 35 miles per hour, people, um, and, and look at them closer and see see what you like and what you don't like. Um, I think that's always very helpful. I gotta tell you, there's a lot about Severance Corners Village Center area that I didn't necessarily like from the roadway for many years. But when I got out there and walked around, I saw a lot of, saw a lot of little hidden things that are actually really nice um, at the pedestrian scale that you don't always get from far over at the road, um, which have stood out to me and so. I think that's where we are with that. This is the first time we'll look at form based zoning since it's been implemented. We haven't, we've never gone back. Yeah. So we've got a few years up at it progressing. So this will be our first time to go back and take a closer look and see what the problems you guys have had with it. We don't see it enough to really mm -hmm. you know, have like a PhD in it. We yeah. see it once in a while and yeah. it's un unexpected. Like, I couldn't tell you what it looks like because I have to reread it. It's a big project though when you hit you. Yeah. It's not a little it's not like a little tiny house we're looking at. And it's very technical. Right. So it's it's kind of these little things can kind of budget. Yeah. Yeah, and I appreciate Matthew what you said about making sure that you know it's a line that you want to walk where you want to be extremely clear and extremely predictable. But you also want to make sure that you have the ability to use common sense when something just isn't fitting and the regulation just doesn't make any sense. And I remember with the bays, I think that was one of the first or only meetings that I, I joined the DRB at. We were talking about that bay issue and it 
Zach and I were scratching our heads because we're like 60 foot gaps. That's just silly. Um, so, you know, it's not an insult to anyone wrote it. I think it's a great code. It's just, you live, you learn, you, you build, you, you review and, and you see what's working and what's not. And I'm really actually very excited to, to get back to it. Um, anything else on form based code before we kick off another thing on our bingo card? So you can mark your free space. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing I want to clarify before we move into uh, shoreland overlay is I put some notes underneath of decisions by the board, and I just want to make sure we're drawing on the decisions because you know there may be applications the board is deliberating on, and we don't want to discuss or draw upon anything that's you know uh, if there's no decision on. Um, otherwise, you're inviting the planning commission to a deliberative session. That. But there have been decisions related to these items. So in the shoreland overlay, which the um, planning commission is taking a look at um, tonight um, and through the supplement that's currently under review, um, one thing that I, I've made a note of is you know the definition of a seawall. You know we had um, an applicant come forward with two walls on their property, and I think this kind of um, gets to what I think Evan has pointed out, um, where, you know, you we have this regulation that discusses requirements for seawalls, which we understand as retaining walls along the lake. Um, but there's no definition of it. So if a wall is set back from the lake, is it still a seawall? I know that's been, you know, pointed out by the DRB. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, you know, put that out there let any other DRB members weigh in on that or planning commission members ask questions, but anything else to add there? That's a good one. We don't have a definition of a seawall. No. That I mean, I worked on that myself on this board quite a bit. It was a big deal. And everything we did, we never put a definition. Interesting. We have a million ways to build them, proper ways. We're all about natural to start with. That was like the big thing. Right. You know, we don't have as much natural material as you could put down before we got to the cement. And then if you put the cement down, how much cement? How much could you move towards the lake? And we don't want lake uh, land grab. Right. That was a big deal. We had a lawsuit go through down where somebody we thought had did a land grab on us. But we have no definition of actually what it does or where it should sit. We must have a definition on how far back. No. You know, we no, didn't put no. what? No, it, no, no, there's um, nothing. To, no, there isn't. And we've got um, seawalls that uh, they're kind of straight to the, they just go down below 95 feet and they're right to the thing. And then we've got some that are actually back quite a ways. You know, we've got terraced ones. We've got very, very, very tall ones. We've got one that's like night and it's ridiculously tall. But that's because they've got this whole terrace you know, garden thing going on. Um, yeah, no, that's interesting. And we have one that I've been, that I've done with, which would, it would be difficult to determine where the seawall really is because there's two walls and there's certain flood stages where the water actually comes behind the first one. So mm. they're, they're kind of both seawalls. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are they always functional? I mean, a seawall, it's never cosmetic, right? I mean, it's cosmetic, but does it always have to be functional, like the whole? I always think a seawall is Yeah, and that's, in, that's in the requirements. Yeah. You okay. have to show need. You have okay. to show yeah. that there is erosion that you're dealing with. So, yeah. yes, a retaining wall and a sea. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> Oh. I was just going to say, we've had as a board, in, in the short time that I've been on the board, a fair amount of consternation about that, the proof of need, oh, because um, people can, you know, uh, applicants have proposed to build very tall seawalls that do meet the proof of need. There's erosion. <clears throat> but then they end up being so tall that now they're making more space, yeah. living space, usable space, which kind of exceeds that you know, minimum mm -hmm. dimensional requirement of a seawall to resist erosion on the shore, which is really, so the seawall needs a better definition, 
number one for to, so we can evaluate that proof of need I think and then I would say the regs around that like we could have a little bit better clarification around proof of need or maybe better language to point us um, as a board and how to evaluate that I think that I'd say 90% of the applications we see are for like rebuilds and I've seen very few brand new seawalls um, but generally it's a rebuild and there's there's always a need to go a little higher you, know, you can always explain it and we usually refer to uh, no new you know flat surface yeah right? which is expressly in the yeah, guidelines. And we're relying on a you know professional's <clears throat> opinion about that need. So we don't want to like, as a board, we can't say, well, we don't think you really need that. You know, um, or it would be um, maybe not our place to do that. I guess so. Um, That's interesting. <laughs> That's the first time we've brought that back because we went through. Well, you weren't here at the time. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was pretty thorough. So this is a good example of get a little, because you see a lot of those. And we had a lot of those at the time. So yeah. that's definitely a point we've missed and should be able to fix, hopefully. Matthew, do you have an idea of how many you roughly see of those? Uh, well, so um, right after Irene is when I joined the board. And it was standing room only see walls. I mean, it was, we were doing two meetings a month and kind of needing a third. Would just see because everybody simultaneously needed a seawall or a camp raise or something mm -hmm. for insurance purposes, but other reasons as well. And uh, there's fewer of them now, but I uh, there's usually kind of towards the fall time, uh, there's a glut of them where there's like at least one per meeting, maybe two, because people are planning out their winter to try and get those all in. Yeah. There's fewer in the spring and summer because they. Uh, don't want to be constructing during that time. Um, I, it, it's a lot less now, but I would say, it, it, you know, it's probably, if I had to guess, I would say six or eight a year. Mm -hmm. But it was, I mean, it was six or eight a month for a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Long time. And I, I can only think of like one or two brand new ones, too. It's always somebody who, like, has a, an old seawall that was built by cave people. <laughs> yeah. So one question I just have, I jotted out a few notes about, you know, defining seawall, uh, maybe defining what proof of need entails, just rather than it's an overarching item, but maybe there's a few criteria in there. Um, and then also, you know, talking about design of the seawall, really, you know, trying to make a kind of all, you know, that existing, you know, contour there. Um, one thing, though, that I did just want to touch on was the, um, just to ask a question is, if there's a wall, you know, for example, there was an application for two seawalls, um, one of which was more so supporting East Lake Shore Drive, in this case, um, falling into a property um, and holding that land back. Um, is that type of wall, you know, still going to be considered a seawall because it's, in close proximity to the lake, or you know, are there certain standards that you want to see a wall like that that are different than a sea wall? No, no answers needed in this moment. That's a big question. But, um, we'll draw you a picture when we get back to it. That is actually a really important question. Yeah. yeah. Is there a house? There's a house between the first one. Well, we can draw a picture here. But maybe I. I'm going to let you draw. I think I know what you mean. <laughs> So the question is, all seawalls are retaining walls, but all retaining walls aren't seawalls. Well, right? yeah, but the way they're described in the regs, they kind of lump them all together. It's like seawalls, retaining walls, or other similar structures. So yeah. it's... It's generally like a failing parking area, perhaps. It yeah. really does need something to shore it up. Right. right. Yep. Well, this is just a lens. Zach, you needed the blue. Come on. Is that, is that <laughs> blue? Planting. This is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so just the light. But hold on a second here. Yeah, there's some old stuff. Yeah. Nice. Oh, Picture. 
Please feel free to talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so is there a um, is there a, a maximum s or uh, size of a seawall that they're trying to stay within, or is it just by need? It's not a you know, existing topography. I think plays a big part of it. Yeah. 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 Topography. I mean, you know. Topography and then the other variable is uh, lake elevation. You know, what, what are the typical high water elevations yeah. of the lake or the extreme levels that, that maybe you, the engineer, is trying to protect against? So you've got that factor on the lake side and then you've got sort of the steepness of the terrain landward. Um, and then, of course, design, integrating the structure into all that. I mean, there's so many different configurations of that that we have to, you know, evaluate that proof of need and it's challenging. So I'll walk you through my illustration here. Um, but I think this kind of gets to the conversation point we're trying to have. But in this Can you see? example okay. here, um, we've got the lake here. You've got a seawall going down to the lake's mean watermark, 95.5. It's a perfect seawall. Um, comes up, you know, out of the floodplains. This is a rebuild, hopefully. Um, and then, you know, you've got this wall up front. I think everyone can agree that that's a seawall. It's serving the purpose of a seawall. Behind the property, there's a need to hold back some land. It's still within the 100 foot you know, distance from the mean water mark. And I think what we're trying to understand is, is that a seawall or is it a wall subject to different standards? Is the top, what's the height of the first seawall? One or two or three? What was that? One or, is the first seawall around higher than 102 or lower than 102? Uh, lower than 102. Well, it's higher than 102. Higher? Yeah, so go with higher. Yeah, I don't. Go I think if, I, if it was lower, Simple that would be a lower. conversation. Because if it's lower, then that is a seawall. Right. This is out of the point. In my opinion, I'm not going to tell you guys what to do, but we. So, what? Just one example that I'll I'll, I'll bring up. There, and if you guys own boats and are out there sailing, you for sure seen this one uh, because it looks like a strip, but it's it's probably like 40 feet tall, and there's this rock ledge. It's it's a huge just ledge and then there's this like strip right directly vertical and what's happened there is that there was some wave action that was causing erosion down at the base of this huge ledge and the person wanted to do a natural solution so they wanted to they put these um, fabricated planting honeycomb matrices I think they call them like a planting matrix on there that was meant to just like hold the the plants together and those plants aren't connected to the rocks they're actually just off it so mm -hmm. that's kind of like how it's resisting the weather is the weather um, now theoretically if you had just a, a foot tall wall behind that if you're saying the second wall is a seawall that would be a seawall too even though it's like 60 feet off the pump you know so we just but we have had that scenario Yeah, and I think this can also be applied to not necessarily huge seawalls that are three quarters of the height of the house, um, but rather, you know, a simple retaining wall that might be proposed yeah. um, to maybe support driveways or, you know, other items on steep slopes in the shortland district. Right, so I, oops, an example. When a seawall is in place, not being proposed, but an applicant comes in. I want to do some grading back back a ways. I'm not going to touch the seawall. Maybe I'm going to make the seawall a little shorter, make some space, retaining walls around my new structure. Is any of that like within the purview, or is it back far enough? Yeah. Hmm. And but it's within the hundred feet. Yes. So that's a little bit of. Or a, even the two fifty that the whole street. Yeah. The street yeah. Has. Absolutely. That's a good question. And we might not have answers tonight, but that's okay because yeah. we still have more of a list to go through. But yeah, that's a good question. We're on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it good? Yeah. 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 Y
leave that there. It definitely wasn't something that was. We end up going back to it. proof of need and if it changes the topography. Yeah. Those are really our two fallbacks to make decisions on. Yeah. It definitely wasn't thought of when we went through last day that that was part of that. Yeah. That was never <laughs> something we thought about. Is there a way you can have some continuity with either the design or the materials? Like when you're coming in from the bay, you know, on a boat, it, it looks a little, I mean, I'm just Four a very... Four-based seawall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a really visual person, and I was just thinking if it, it just had some, something that was tying it a little bit together. You know, I think there's going to be a lot more boat traffic coming in, and it's, it's I think East Lakeshore Drive, the housing looks really nice. It kind of looks like a main village, you know, coming into the bay. But I didn't, I don't know. I mean, I know it has to be functional, you know, and maybe that's all it needs to be. But I, I didn't know if, you know, we could, like, have some kind of parameters about trying to make it, like, something that kind of made the eye just go smooth. You would know probably the engineers Rebecca are more. generally choosing similar materials. Material point. Do you agree? There's, it's there's, just happening. there's the dimensional walls that we, I mean, we've had in the last two years, we've had someone who just wanted to who replace corrugated steel, the, the ugliest wall in the world. And um, no, it was fantastic. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it, it's a uh, it, it dimensional stone. It what they're talking about, dude, that's excessively expensive. It is. And it's yeah. really nice. Yeah. And if, you know, we could, it would be like, in the hospital. That's sort of not something that we can subject. I, well, it's up to you guys. Who we do. But, um, that's, I think, difficult. And there's also a technical situation where, you know, um, things like gabions are just necessary even though they're hideous because of the nature of um, stormwater remediation. Historically, you've got some pipe daylighting that was put in there in the 40s and that's, it is what it is. So you've got to have a gabion in there, otherwise you're going to lose the whole property. What's so, a gabion? Gabion is one of these things where it's a bunch of riprap, with the small rocks and whatever that's just put into like some chain link fencing that's made of you know, Oh, right. I've seen that. So, you know. Um, okay, just so, the thought. Um, it's difficult to. Well, I will say that ever since I've been on the planning commission, everything we've done is to make sure if you own that property, you should be able to stay there. We don't want to set up so you have to sell it. You just can't afford to fix it. Right. So that's been always, always the case. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be it'd be unfair to tell everyone they needed to get moved in court side dimensional stuff. Yeah. 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 No, I yeah. Block, I just didn't know if there was that. some element that, you know, visually, you know, maybe not material. I don't know. You know, but anyway, it was just an idea. So so is aesthetics not a not mentioned as a word. When they consider that, is that what you mean? Because there's a, a landscaping budget for all yeah, the exactly problems, landscaping, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then and that last one we looked at with Bridge. you know overhanging grasses, mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't seem expensive, but it could be still a little on that one. Gotcha. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, <laughs> I, mean, I just wondered if aesthetics was on there. I think I think big cement blocks are discouraged. Did I read that? Where? Native vegetation is encouraged and yeah. maximizing vegetation, but it's not really a hard, um, I wouldn't call it a hard review No, it never was criteria. intended that way. It's no. a recommendation, really. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the, la the landscaping review would never touch the seawall, to, to, to your point? I think where they're concerned about that, it's about tree cutting, present 25% out. Yeah. They want to make sure that they're not overdoing it there. When structural landscaping than aesthetic landscaping. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts on seawalls? Did I overhear you say that we're, that um, Colchester is going the other direction with respect to delegation in the shoreline? Uh, no, sorry, for wastewater. wastewater. So we, okay, okay. No changes to shoreland. I was like, we can just stop talking about it. <laughs> no such luck. No, no, no. no. I, I, I I've actually, I have never sat down and compared our regulations with the state ones, so I can't tell you exactly what the differences are. But as far as I know, there has been no talk about um, 
giving up that delegation, just the wastewater delegation. I mean, I don't want oversight, but I think it's an important benefit for the residents and the developers within Colchester that these decisions can be made here. And in fact, when we talk about the shoreland, uh, Zach has reminded me, we have to be very careful because when we're giving, given delegation, we had an actual set of tax. It's a little bit different than wastewater that we had to submit to the state that gets approved and then it's our actual regulations. It's not like, sure, you can do it, make up your own rules. Um, and so when we do any changes to that section, we have to be extra careful because we probably have to bring that back to that same authorizing agency and say, hey, we want to change this, please approve it. Um, and in fact, it, we're talking about one as part of Supplement 45, the fix is not in that section. The fix has been to add definition um, in Chapter 12, um, where they didn't exist before. So we talk about, for example, degree of encroachment. We don't define degree of encroachment. Um, and so in order to better clarify that, we have put that into Chapter 12. And we're very careful what we do within 703. I never get section numbers right. Mm -hmm. it's a huge weakness of mine. Um, <laughs> I didn't look, I promise. <laughs> um, so we do, when it comes to the shoreland stuff, we are we have to walk on different a different set of right, a different process than we might otherwise, and we have to be a little more careful. I'm not saying it couldn't be approved by the state, but um, it is an extra layer of approval that doesn't exist for most of the rest of our regulations. So. And on the topic of shoreland, there's one other part here, which is the 10% increase in enlargement of structures um, that, you know, is a conditional use in the shoreland overlay district. And I just want to flag that because, um, you know, there's been a couple proposals in my time, one of which that comes to mind is one that was out of Coates Island Road, where they wanted to enlarge a deck so that they could have a landing for stairs. Um, and you know, right now the only item that's you know considered by the board. Um, so Zach, be, very quickly, can you, for especially a lot of the new people, tell yes. us what that ten percent means? So there is uh, in the regulations, you know, an applicant can come forward and um, apply for a conditional use review to enlarge a structure in the shoreland overlay district. That's that one hundred feet. In the one hundred foot zone uh, from the mean water mark. Um, and you know you're really looking at. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Please tell me cupcake. <laughs> Frosting. <laughs> so you're you're looking at uh, you know 10 percent of that primary structure, excluding decks, porches, overhangs, stairs. Um, really, 10 percent of that primary structure. Um, so if you have a really small camp, uh, 100 square feet, uh, real camp. And square feet that you'd be able to apply for. Um, usually, you see it, you know, like a small deck being applied for, or um, you know, it, an increase in the size of a deck to accommodate stairs. Um, in the case of the um, the Coates Island application, right now, when the board receives these applications, they're looking at you know an additional criteria that you know asks that an applicant demonstrate that. The enlargement cannot reasonably be accomplished without further encroachment due to topography, shape of the lot, or interior floor plan layout. Um, ultimately, you know, I'm I'm wondering, and I've heard from the board that you know there might they might want to see some more justification for these requests. Um, but that being said, I haven't heard it too explicitly, so I'd love to hear from you what you think um, about those requests. Or would you like to see go into those requests? That's the last one I remember. It was That's Coates Island. the most recent one now. So this one has a lot going on. Some of it is clarifying the regulations because it's not entirely clear what, um, what gives you that, um, what was the language we talked about earlier, Zach? Like what qualifies you in some way? We were talking about proof of need. 
proof of need, okay. Um, so there's that, and then and some of it is also just policy. We talk about 10%. 10%, we have seen homes in this, in this area where 10% gets you a modest size 80 foot deck. 10% in some other areas is a pretty significant encroachment into that 100 foot shoreland overlay. So part of this might be a policy question might be a good time to reaffirm whether or not you mean 10%. Do you mean 10% of anything up to any sort of cap? Do you mean 10% up to a cap? Um, so I think there's a lot you could unpack here uh, if you choose to take it up, um, at least at the very least in sort of clarifying what need means. Um, as, as Zach has, had said earlier, you know, do you need a deck? Um, is, where's the, the level of need? Um, but um, definitely a lot of questions there, I think. And, and uh, we've even seen people who, whether intentionally or not, have added extra square footage so that their 10% is now bigger, taking 10% of a bigger number. Um, we've even seen it in a decision that was a little problematic because it had said, well, sh prove, it, prove how much land you have later, and then you get 10% of that. Um, I won't say much more because I think we're still actively in litigation over that one. Um, so I think there's some movement there. There's some, some fair discussion um, from a technical perspective and from a policy perspective. And um, maybe there is no discussion. Maybe you're all sitting here thinking 10% is perfect. I don't see what the problem is. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of ways you can unpack that one. Well, hopefully oh. we'll start flying through the list. Before you go on, I'm going to poke to Matthew to pass the plates. <laughs> oh, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, on that one, too, like, they're, they're just, it, and I don't know, know that it's a planning commission's business, but there, to what Kathy Ann has said is right, is that there's some kind of um, trying to game the system and, and claim that a, a floor plan is larger than it really is, or incorporating a, a shed in the square footage, or you know, kind of strangeness like this. Um, and I want to say at one point we asked them to go out and remeasure it, like or send Derek out or somebody out there to actually like go ahead and take a ruler because they were saying that it was like a football field, but it's clearly a postage stamp, and it was. <laughs> and it, and it, what, Whatever you guys say yeah. will do, but it's definitely a point where we have to be peeling in quite a bit on these. And, and, um, and this has come up even in recent discussions. Is it 10% of what the tax assessor says you have? Well, the tax assessor <clears throat> yeah. says what he sees. He doesn't say what is permitted. So is it 10%? We talked about just the, um, we talked about this with the Planning Commission just last week. Yeah. Are we talking about permitted spaces? If you built something five years ago without a permit, Okay, probably not going to count. But what if you built it 20 years ago? What if you, um, do you get to count that? Yeah, um, not only that, but they were measuring the outside so, of the building instead of the inside. So yeah. Six inches, of, and it sounds ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> That's the level of, and I gotta, the lobster lab. It definitely doesn't I, sound ridiculous. Gotta we get to make sure everything, every inch counts just yeah. about. Yeah. It's difficult it. for an attorney as well because they say, I have 2,000 square feet. I don't know what you're talking about. Look at the tax record. Well, again, the tax record is a notice of observation. The assessor goes out, they write down all of the rooms, they say you have this, they don't call us and say, hey, because there's a lot of properties in town. So I think there's, without a doubt, anything that we talk about, there's probably some benefit in clarifying when we say a percentage of, what does that mean? Is that approved space or not? Mm -hmm. Food for thought. Yeah, for sure. All right. Deck. So we'll go down now into subdivision standards, and hopefully these first two will be pretty quick. But one thing I want to note here on um, 905 b So 905 is generally where a lot of the development review boards review standards for subdivisions are. Um, so any subdivision that gets proposed gets reviewed against these criteria. Um, in one case, but actually in a lot of them, 905B suitability of the land 
this is really where the board is looking at um, you know, what characteristics are on the land that should be accommodated, avoided. Um, you know, you start to see building envelope shifting, lot layup shifting based on where different resources are on the land. Um, we've mentioned, you know, here rare and irreplaceable natural areas as defined by the Vermont Non-Game Natural Heritage Program. Really one simple update that's actually been kind of uh, brought forward through um, some interested neighbors on a sketch plan proposal up in um, Matthews Neck of the Woods um, is it's technically significant natural community is the term they're using. Any maps are going to say significant natural community and then there's a, um, I believe it's an environmental occurrence report for each of those that gives more information on what that community is. Um, so it might be worth an update here. It, that's a pretty simple one. Um, but, you know, just wanted to flag that because it really comes up with almost every subdivision. What was the term you just used? Natural. Significant natural community. So where is that? Something written down here? What is that? It's, I believe it's a, uh, the term that uh, Vermont Agency of Natural Resources is using. But um, we don't apply that anywhere as of yet. Well, we currently use um, rare and irreplaceable natural area, which I believe is lumped inside of that term. Okay. Um, so it could be something worth looking at to see where those distinctions are with the two terms. Um, just to make sure that any resources that the board relies on um, correspond with the right need. Sure. Okay. That one seems simple. Is that as simple as That's it sounds? That's a simple one, yeah. yeah. All right. Very yeah. 46 people. I think you one there. Mm -hmm. um, moving down the list <laughs> to building envelopes. Um, this happens, again, in a lot of subdivision reviews. The building envelope is generally the area of developable land within a lot. Um, you know, something so, that conforms to setback. Could you zoom just a little? It's really small for us back here. Unfortunately, I can't. You can't zoom in on my face. No. Yeah. I'll really? uh, try. Actually, oh, yeah, yeah, you can. You can. You definitely can. You can change the scale of the little three dots, too. You can. See, I can't on my browser. own computer. Let me scroll down here. Oh, if it helps, I have the full draft of the regulations right here. <laughs> okay, so this will only help for a moment. Um, but building envelopes, um, this section of the subdivision uh, subdivision review criteria um, allows the board to designate building envelopes. Um, generally, looking at restricting things from um, you know streams, wetlands. Um, the general setbacks of the district. Um, but one thing is uh, there's a requirement here that, um, or language that says that um, parking areas um, need to be included within a building envelope. Um, and then in the definition of building envelope, it also includes septic systems, um, which I know has come up about whether those are even structures. Um, some applicants have asked that. Um, and I think, you know, the board definitely wants to make sure they're on the same page about what should be within a building envelope. And the reason I flag parking areas is that um, I believe under Article 10, there's a requirement that those only need to be five feet from a property line, um, not within a, a building envelope where a structure can be that close, but a parking area can be a bit closer. Um, so maybe there's some trimming up to happen here, but I definitely want to make sure that you know, the board can express any um, anything they've heard about building envelopes, uh, especially with the septic systems, <laughs> and it's not, so take that. But any questions from the Planning Commission on this? So we basically want to punch that out. Okay, get, uh, and we want the building envelope to be tight enough so it's structured. That's what, that's what we're talking about, basically, here. So if we pull out the setbacks, we're still worried about structure, not the actual parking area. The septic, as long as it fits somewhere in the lot, we'll worry about the building envelope. Yeah, so you might be looking at changing the definition of a building envelope to exclude certain yeah. um, you know, things like a parking area or a septic system. Okay. Um, a pool is considered a structure. Pools? Right? Yes. That's what we want. We do maintain that in the building envelope. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We do? 
You definitely want to keep that in the building envelope, you think? Well, cool. I think you guys have, well, the term building envelope is a little bit different from what I think you're thinking about. Building envelope is the area within which you put the items that you build. Right. It's not an actual structure. It's just right. the area to find where you can build. Correct. So anything in that envelope, the house, a pool, a shed, all that has to fit in that envelope. And your wastewater, between your wastewater and your gas line and your well, they have to be certain distance away from each other. So you have to, I think, uh, you know, that it just concerns me not looking at the wastewater because there'll be other elements that have to play off of that in terms of distance and, and within that building envelope. Yeah, you know, wastewater systems, I think I would um, definitely want to, you know, talk to at the end about it, especially with the return of the delegation of that, of the wastewater program, um, to make sure that, you know, we've been operating under a, um, under having that local delegation. So including something like this in your subdivision review makes a lot of sense when you're also the town with that regulation, um, regulatory authority uh, to say where septic systems are going. Um, but that being said, it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. So I want to make sure that know, the board would still have the jurisdiction to require the septic system to be located. Um, oftentimes, that's a separate review process. Um, and you're right that they do, you know, the placement of those systems often relies on where other well systems are in their area. I think that the, this regulation is well intended. What it's trying to say is that, especially if you have a very large lot, that you are not spreading out development all across it if in within this as it's written here the board finds that they don't want to see um, you know your garage set way over here and your workshop here and and all of a sudden you take maybe this will be something that comes up more as we get into an open space plan and anything that comes out of that if there's any you know fragmentation language um, it would give the board the authority to limit that sort of land consumption on a lot by saying you have the ability to, to restrict that, especially if one, one portion is a wetland or even a non-regulated natural resource, for example, a, a good stand of trees, and we say, why are you building, why are you cutting all these trees down to build your home when you could be doing it over here in this open area? So I think that the idea of it is very good. It gives the board that authority. Um, but did it also come with some unintended consequences? We'll see. And specifically for subdivisions where there's multiple homes that they're trying to fit. Yeah, into like it. the spaghetti lots is where a lot of them are like, what is a septic system? I mean, it sounds again, ridiculous, but is it a structure or, mm -hmm. you know, where, where is it? So they're trying to, they're trying to fit the maximum number of homes into this lot where so they've got you know the road going right through the the open land you know strung along in and you guys have dealt with that and thank you very much um but uh you know along the along the back side you've got your building envelope and then the, the septic systems like pushed way out to the property line and, uh, if they're a mound system is it a structure Interpretation. That's tricky. You want the, uh, do you want to be able to, because I know you guys are usually like the black and white. So now we're talking about a gray area as far as an envelope, and Kathy's talking about this, he has this piece of property, he wants to start spacing his, uh, whatever he's building around. Did you want to have that to say, no, we'd like to see it pulled in? Do you want to get invested in that? Because that's starting to push towards design view. Mm. How much does a person, when they have their property, how much leeway do you want to give them? I, I'm big on property rights, and you want to build it out. That's your, your toy that you want to build. Well, let, let me. Buffer zone. <laughs> Kathy wants to get all over me on that one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I don't make decisions. <laughs> I know. But I do want to just give you food for thought on yeah. that. So I definitely want 
did take a picture to memorialize this time. It's a very nice picture. You should have seen the drawing I did at the last planning commission meeting. It was awful. Oh, okay, hang on. You did that on your computer, so it was pretty Yeah, cool. I opened up paint. Yeah. I didn't even use MS Paint in the last 10 years. MS Paint. My first time. Okay, so I think. So I think that where you might see this come up, or it could come up, maybe not, the planning commission's not so inclined, is that I'll go back to what Matthew said about some spaghetti lots. So if you have, whoop, you know what, there's two sides to this. <laughs> We're going to spin. that come in, right? What a standard like that would do is allow the board to say, um, and let's just pretend, there is a beautiful forest in the back here. What this would do is allow a board to say, um, your building envelope doesn't extend past here. This is your, we're going to set building envelopes like this, right? Because otherwise, what you might get, you will get probably, is a very long driveway. With the house and the pool and the kids play structure and everything else and then you have all these long driveways and no more trees um, which if so inclined could create concerns around stormwater natural resource forest fragmentation all kinds of things that's why somebody might want to do it um, obviously the reason we're talking about this is it might not be the case Rich and the whole planning commission may say, I don't see the problem. Um, so building envelopes do become important. Um, what you do want to attach to them, though, is some sort of standards, because that would be very open-ended. This would allow the board to say, well, there's, there's a forest here. That's my reason. Uh, but maybe that forest doesn't exist in the next similar project like it. Is there a reason needed there? We also see, <clears throat> imagine just one of those spaghetti lots and then subdivision of that, because those are existing all over the place. And so, see the one on the left, the single spaghetti lot, and they're going to subdivide that into three, three uh, parcels. Yeah, so that's the one, if, like on Watkins Road, where that's where we kind of closed. Yeah, so you're oh, way close. Right? Your buffer <laughs> zone is pretty COVID. Built out. Yeah. Huh? Your buffer zone is very, you know, it's, it's, Regulated, but you know, it doesn't leave you much in the middle. Right. And then uh, your building envelope has to sit outside of that, but your septic may be in the buffer zone, which is allowed. But does that uh, building envelope have to include the septic? Because yeah. they, they conflict. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not super clear. Sometimes it might be difficult to determine if the septic should be in the building envelope because septic will depend on soils. So the soils aren't great. So again, it goes from the system or in ground. I mean, there could be a distinction there, uh, whether it's a structure or not. Um, I, yeah, I would say that since this is something I do in my profession, in other towns that 
aren't delegated, the septic system generally is not considered a structure because there are setbacks in the state rules that prescribe where the designer puts it. So, regardless, mounder. Yes. Ah, uh, well, they differ, but yeah, they differ based on whether it's in ground or mount. In this case, with the forest, we don't want to end up at to exclude the septic system. Oh yeah, it's not outside the forest. That's right. That was important. I think otherwise, I could take down all the trees and put the septic system now. I think there's lots of ways to write it. If if the commission said, hey, we really want to only if necessary, only if there's absolutely nowhere else to put a septic system, because then you cannot build a home and you're probably going to qualify for some sort of variance, um, then you could put it there. So there's lots of ways to write it. Yeah. Once Similar you have to that. what the driveway ended up sounding like. like. You're still allowed to do that ridiculous driveway down the shared, the, the common land, if that is like the only way to make the project work. Of course, the planner in me wants to force them to have a shared driveway. And yeah. not two of them, but that's a different conversation for today. <laughs> OK. So it seems like maybe there's more to discuss down the line related to the open space planning. But is no, there a quick uh, fix? Um, well, the quick fix might be understanding the town's limitations in regulating where septic systems are right now, um, especially with the um, return of the delegation. Um, so that one, we'll see how that works out. But um, there could be definition updates as well to, make, you know, to remedy that. Um, all right. Moving on a bit down the list here. Um, 905J Street. Um, now this is really one to just kind of start a discussion tonight. Um, and it actually, anything to do with this section of the regulations usually gets pretty significant input from the Department of Public Works. Um, because it's related to compliance with Chapter 14 of the Code of Ordinances, related to uh, streets, roads, um, specifications and standards related to those. Um, one thing I did want to point out, just because you know it's something the board sees a lot, is um, under number four here. Um, there's a threshold that you know when a driveway or a road serves more than four units, um, that driveway or road either needs to be public or plan to be uh, designed to a public standard. Um, and sometimes there's been instances where applicants will come in for a four unit minor subdivision um, and then come in for a final, they'll get an approval and then they'll get a final plat amendment approval to add on, you know, a couple more units at the end of the driveway and get a waiver from the Department of Public Works saying, oh, in this case, this doesn't need to be a public road. And you know, in, in those cases, we really want to make sure that um, you know you want to have consistent regulations up front, um, but also understanding that maybe that four-unit threshold's a little too low based on what development um, you know the town might accept being at the end of a, a private driveway. Um, so regardless of wherever we end up, Zach has said this a whole lot kinder than I would have. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys understanding what the issue is here? Yeah. You can draw it out if you want. Right yeah. across from Mill Pond Road. I can't remember. I, I we can't don't need it. Something? What, what is Anna's Court across from Mill Pond Road? That's uh, mountains, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So across from uh, the, the, uh, the upper entrance to Mill Pond Road, across from there, there's a, a little subdivision where they did exactly this. They came in for four, and they came in for three because they wanted they didn't want to make it a public road. So it's a, it's an intentional it's act, just to be clear. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you do yeah. four, you get it's it in. Name. It is. You might even Show build the road out. out. Yep. You're like, oh, the road's already there, but I can fit in one more. I'm not really going to make you make it a public road now. 
I mean, so this is happening frequently. Yeah, because that waiver has been given so many times, it's not even built yet. Honestly, a lot of times they get approval and they come in like a couple months later. Oh, plot amendment. And it's a very tough thing, I, I'm sure, for you guys because you're like, it fits. But would you have reviewed it differently if they started with five or six? Well, has there ever been a case where you have this driveway that's serving five or six houses now, and then they say, oh, well, why, why isn't this a public road now? Shouldn't you know, ask the town, make this a public road? I mean, has that ever happened? Or it's just... I'd be surprised if it didn't. Um, but, you know, there's a... There's a whole lot of discussion as to what the tipping point should be for a private versus public road. I'll sit down, I'm sorry. Um, and I think that what, I'm, what I've heard from members of the board especially are that like, let's just say what we mean and mean what we say. If it's four, let's mean four. If it's five or six, let's just say that up front. Stop forcing us into this awkward waiver discussion. Um, so let's let's just let's just mean what we say, um, and then there could be a whole debate. As Zach said, you'd want to include your public works department. Um, you'd want to include your select board, of course, because the differences between a public and private road are not insignificant, um, both in how you construct it and then how you maintain it afterwards. And uh, there's definitely pros and cons. We've had this discussion um, internally um, at multiple levels many times because. There are definitely um, benefits that come from having private roads and public roads, and um, and it's not for, I think, planning staff to even weigh in on other than to say, as we're hearing from members of the board, let's just be clear. Um, whatever it is, whatever that number is, let's mean it, um, and let's hold to it. Um, and if four is not the right number, let's make it the right number. Um, if we did decide to take this up, I think the very first thing we'd probably do, obviously, is, uh, secondarily to talking to our public works department, is probably get an idea of what our other towns doing. Um, I I don't know. I know you know I can only speak to a, another one that I was familiar with, and our magic number was nine. Um, anything more than nine became a public road. Um, anything more than three, as you know, for me, nine one one has to be a road. Um, but. Where do you draw the line between public and private? Um, and it's not just numbers. There's more that goes into it, I think, especially if you're talking about not just a residential street. But um, I think it would it would definitely benefit everybody from the board to the public to the development community to just know what the right number is. And it seems that four may not be it. <laughs> so it comes up often. Definitely is not it. You know, yeah. if you see the rules keep getting pushed, my flavor is after you've seen it enough times, you know that's not the right number. And without speaking on behalf of the Public Works Department, who is not here, I do know that it's, nobody ever wants to be in a situation where they're constantly having to grant waivers. Um, so I think they've at least shared that with us, that um, I don't think they love that either because they're constantly being asked and having to make not by you guys, but by anybody who's building. And uh, they'd rather have a very clear standard as well. Um, and keep waivers to be the unusual, not the norm. So. so more work to be done there. Yeah. And it'll be, a, it'll be an interesting debate. I think it's one that will, if you take it up, get quite a few people out because there's, it's, um, it's very policy heavy and you're, I'm gonna sit on my hands and let you guys do it. It's All tricky. Right. All right, so keeping an eye on the time. Um, I do think we can move through planned unit development standards pretty quickly. There's not a lot of, um, you know, high discussion points. Maybe Matthew might disagree with me. No, um, no, no. I think these are like, hey, cut it out. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not a <laughs> so quick, uh, you know, primer on the first one here, 907D, um, you know, there's certain waivers and reductions that the board can grant when an application comes through um, subdivide land um, as part of a planned unit development. Um, those are pretty clearly listed here in this, um, 
you know, table, table, table 907D1A. Um, that being said, um, I do want to just first note that for any application to come in for a plan unit development, um, they need to have at least 1.5 acres of land. Um, so the first item here I just want to, you know, point you towards at this table is um, there's some language in this table related to a three acre threshold for projects over three acres. Um, you'll see it come up. Uh, and in these cases, you know, the looking back historically, the threshold for plant new development used to be three acres. Um, so I, you know, I think the DRB wants to make sure there's some clarity um, and just uh, understanding if, if that is a, a threshold at which there's additional considerations for granting like a public road frontage reduction, um, or if it's just a carryover from the previous um, threshold to even get it to this level of review. Um, and then also on this, you know, um, just taking a look at these, you know, um, you know, uh, reductions and waivers, and you know, if there's anything that stands out, any questions you have, planning commission, about how these are being applied, um, you know, I'm sure the board, if you have development review board, would be happy to answer some of those, or I would be as well. So that's how we you've been looking at it, though. I guess so. Yes. The 1.5, and then they come in over three you skip down and say this is what we want. Well, so one thing I'll, I'll provide a bit of background on is that, for example, um, public road frontage is something that can be reduced or, or waived by the developer review board. Um, very often those lots that are at 1.5 acres have very little frontage, not enough to support two or three units. They might be applying for four. Um, and the board's then, in that case, going to be tasked with saying, does this, you know, lot that might need this reduction the most not qualify because of the three acre, um, you know, language here? <laughs> so I'm happy to re-explain it. Um, I mean, really, the, the main items are the threshold to get into this review is 1.5 acres. I think the board just wants to make sure that any reductions or waivers they're granting under this table are for the right size lots. So if they shouldn't be granting one because it's only something that can be granted for larger three-acre lots, they want to make sure that they yeah. Correct. So we'll take, we definitely will take a look at that and see. So we went to 1.5, that was part of that. So we went to 1.5 because we're all about the infill, more housing, the whole thing. I don't know if we really discussed this three acre part, honestly. So we definitely should bring in, visit that. It just seems like what's the impetus for having this at three? If, yeah. If, it, it's, if it's what you meant, then awesome. If yeah. not, probably something. I think it's an oversight. All right, so maybe supplement 46. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Um, moving down the list a little bit here to um, open space requirements. Um, one item you know, uh, that we, I just think might need a bit of clarity on. So for certain projects under this review, there's an open space requirement. Um, the threshold here is uh, they're required except for those properties under three acres or five units in size. Um, and the language here, you know, um, do you want to see open space for properties that are um, over three acres, over five units, or for properties over five units and over three acres? You know, so that and or the or can be tricky at times, um, where someone wants to add another you know, unit to a large lot. So it can be two units, but you know, five acres, and they might need an open space requirement um, here. Um, and then I do want to get to recreational amenities. 
Okay. Um, so Matthew's ready to take this one away. <laughs> oh my God. So uh, they, they hit it on the head with the example of St. Michael's College, Champlain Housing Trust. Um, they, all of the, this existing infrastructure and buildings are all there. They're trying to um, transform a dorm basically into some housing. And uh, they needed to have a recreational amenity just because of the, the nature of it. And, it was just a building in a parking lot, and, they, and they're trying to figure out if they can count like this other access to a bike path or what they're doing. And they all ended up um, uh, spending money on putting in ultimate frisbee goals in between, <laughs> like the breezeway. You can't make this stuff up. Right. Like, <laughs> like half the half the width of this building, uh, or like of this room, little frisbee golf you know, thing, and then like a parking lot on either side, and you just see these frisbees like whipping along, <laughs> right, and into, into windows and all this sort of stuff, and it's just, they were kind of snookered into this scenario where they had to provide something that was definitely not a benefit, and it was kind of like to fill a gap, right? Right. and so I think it, <laughs> and, it and you know, we, there, there's another one I, um, I don't think it's here, but it was it was a closed one now where uh, um, this person uh, needed a recreational amenity because they were changing a, um, uh, a five bedroom farmhouse into uh, in an apartment right on um, right off of Lakeshore, not on Lakeshore, mm -hmm. but on, on the way towards the airport. Park. And uh, they they were struggling to figure out what kind of amenity they needed, and you know. Even though on this property they had you know, fire pit and lakeshore access and room for a pony and yeah. two barns and an art studio and, and jacuzzi, you know, it's like all right, you have the opposite problem. But it, you know, it, it sort of is one of these kind of things where um, I think the um, yeah, the what is this really about? Maybe <laughs> that one should be looked at. We, I know over the years, the Planning Commission has downgraded a lot of the rec recreational necessities. We've got real pocket, pocket parts at one time, yeah. all those things, you know. It comes a time when, you're right, some things get a little ridiculous, and why do we still have it? I, I think, anyways. Yeah. You think, think you guys really nice to have playgrounds? Yeah. I mean, I know we have some great playgrounds, but I mean, I just think it's just nice even just to have even a small playground that the, you know, own, homeowners can bring their kids to and yeah. meet up with. But I just wonder if it would There's, have... I, I, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but there is some complaints specifically about the playgrounds hmm. because the Homeowners Association has to maintain them and the liability insurance yeah, is excessive. If, yeah. So I'll just mention it. I totally agree. Top yeah. lots are great. Nobody wants them. Yeah. And, I, and the, the insurance I was just going to yeah. ask hmm. about. But could they do something where maybe they didn't do something on the land? But this is just poor Rick has to put up with this. I just saw with my thinking. Um, but like you, where you could, you know, people could build segments of a bike path. You know, it might not be on the land or anything like that. But that you could just that would meet that requirement, like a trail or something, you yeah. know, to hook up to a bike path. 99% of the time that's what happens. They do a cinder path. And it can be, it, we've had some pretty silly cinder paths to like nowhere, right? And, <laughs> and, I mean, it is like sometimes, it's, anyway, um, but with this one specifically, there was no option other than to put everyone's property and lives at risk with a frisbee golf course. <laughs> Yeah. In the middle of a parking lot. Yeah. And adjacent to it was, I think, public. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a public park. With oh, park. interesting. Basically there. Yeah. That's not, what I was thinking. Of. Does not count. It's so, got 40 pounds. Yeah. It was right there. Yeah. Yeah. They have that huge yeah. park off Dalton Drive. Right. And yeah. Dalton Drive. I mean, that serves that area. You wonder if there should be an exception. Mm -hmm. Or even yeah. if it's developed, it, the recreational amenity doesn't. Is already there, right? And that came up. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Like that, we were know. on the path. We yeah. couldn't be in a better <laughs> position to leverage this, but yet 
<laughs> we need to break a bunch of windows. You know, <laughs> like, for real. So I hope the Planning Commission does take this up, because I have spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I have a ton of ideas to throw at you. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no you doubt. Do take it up. And this could be a fun discussion. I think it's fun. I don't yeah. know. It's, it's one of the pieces that I've I've always enjoyed writing the most. Yeah, that it's, went from scaling is important. Scaling and recognition yeah. of adjacent yeah. elements. Because there was a time it's I was critical. on the board for a long time, and there was a time when everybody wanted their own little parks. They wanted their own little amenities, and they would drive you know the rec board crazy because we were running all over the place. And then one by one they were closed off. And the idea was. Just like this, we have parks all around. Yep. We shouldn't have to have every single building has to have its own amenity. Yep. So your times have changed. And, and, and just one other thing, I'll kind of mention to, to almost you hit the nail on the head. When there's one of these that happens to be adjacent to the lake, they can claim the lake as a recreational amenity, but they don't own the lake, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're just near it enough, and or if they have access mm -hmm. to it, yeah. like that's the amenity. And so, I mean, it, but it's just a, it's just a, a, a verbal barrier. Yeah. Right? And on the opposite end, are you finding that you have enough protection in the regulations for very large developments? I know that a lot of, one of our most built out quadrants of the um, growth center, um, do you feel I know maybe a lot of you weren't on the board at the time, but it's pretty light on amenities. Do you think that was a result of the way the regulations were written? Was it a result of a negotiation that just didn't produce what we'd hoped it might? Or maybe you don't feel it's yeah. light at all. It's got a tot lot. So that one's got a really interesting story to it because originally they had the big soccer pitch in the middle. And there were some really cool things about there that, that for community access and amenities. But as it began to get built up and carved up, what you began to realize, um, and the people came in and they were voicing this, and they're not wrong, but each building has its own association and its own liability, and the people in that building have to pay for pools and this. And, and there was one there was one whole building which just wanted to like burn the pool down. I mean, it's made of water, so it's super difficult. But they like didn't want it, and so it's you know having something that's at, at the macroscopic scale, I feel, would be better and you know preserved a little bit better. But it's it's really difficult to to fit without having a, a much larger picture of the zoning in general. But I I suspect awesome from everything I've heard is that you. You don't necessarily want the end result to be that you have, oh gosh, what now, 555 people living there in a tot lot. You know, is that, and if you're watching Patrick, I'm sorry, I'm not picking on your development. I think there's other stuff under development. And, mm -hmm. um, but if that, if it were to be done tomorrow, if building was done and, and nothing else was to come, is a, a, a tot lot sufficient to serve 555 residents? And a cinder um, path. And a cinder It's actually, I, yeah, I give them a lot of credit for that path. It's why, you know, I think it yeah, gets I used a lot. that cinder path. <laughs> <laughs> but I can think of one up too. in my area where it was like, a, it was laughable. Yeah. yeah. It was a cinder path to, uh, along the road, but the wrong way, and it just ends <laughs> at the property line. So but even, even that walking path that they've put around there. I mean, I see people on that yeah. all the time. I mean, as soon as it was built, people were walking on it. I mean, it's very could, widely used. You could, yeah. you know, put other trails on and connect them, you know, to trails. I mean, they could just be walking everywhere around there. A couple of Girl Center had requirements for recreation <clears throat> when it was just from being the Growth Center. Do they have different ones than um, additional or not in our regulations. I don't know that. Yeah. I don't know if it's part of like the state program. I thought it was no. because being designated oh. as a growth center, yeah. there's certain amenities mm -hmm. that you had That's to have. That's a very sore topic. Yeah, yeah. I know. We're going to hold off on that one. Okay. I have to go to the downtown board next week, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's a good example. And they do have the symbiont top lots 
one privately and publicly like next to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just in the daycare one and the Yep, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a daycare one as well? Yeah, Carolyn's has a yeah, a private. For right reasons, to each other. they don't use each other's. <laughs> <laughs> Things are more regulated. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I bet. So probably behind the fence and. Yeah. Oh. So our problem to okay. fix is more of these outside the growth center, these buildings that need something, and what we're putting is not really worth anything. I'm hearing that it's it's really just not right sized that. Um, that there, it's being required of properties that they don't really need it because yeah. because it's already immediately adjacent or the property already has other things that don't technically meet the definition. Um, and so maybe it's partially broadening the definition of what type of amenity can serve this. Is it truly intended to be 100% recreational? And what do you call recreational? Is a community garden recreational? It is the middle of July, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, according oh. on our rec <laughs> deal, anything is arts, gardens, everything's recreation. We include everything. On the other hand, the airport park, the village park, Colchester Pond, all those pieces, as big as they were, the idea was you build, you go to these parks. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't have these little pieces around. So we shouldn't have to worry about this building having to put in a Frisbee because it'll be a big monster one right here at Bayside, hopefully. Or whatever we Maybe need. some kind of like financial mitigation where they right. That's what I was thinking. Add to a fund or something. Right. Like sure. Yeah. yeah. So scaling, I think, is important, and I think that that's probably what's missing right now, is a better, just better scaling for what is expected out of different levels. Again, and I, proximity to. And proximity. Because that one, the one in St. Mike's, you're right about scaling, absolutely, and I think in yeah. the growth centers, there's some seem to be compelled to. Anyway, uh, but at this one, you know. It is that scale. It's but right there. <laughs> it's on the. I mean, you can't be yeah. any closer to it. But. Yeah, for sure. That's for sure. They should get a little credit, in my opinion. I mean, it, it was it was a hard conversation. That one we really struggled with because we all knew that it was good enough, but it wasn't good enough. And what they had to do was just like, I can't believe I'm making them do this. You know. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, okay. so you go for the discussion on it. Um, the last two, I promise, are pretty short. Um, and they're ones that, you know, I think it's just been somewhat noted. First one under 10.02 um, parking lot lighting. Um, let me go ahead and just pull this up here. Um, the board had an application just to upgrade some lighting, and there was a discussion that had occurred about um, linking when lighting is on based on hours of operation, and that after the close of business, you know, 75% would be required to be turned off um, under the regulations. Either. Um, so one thing I do just want to point out is where that language is. 75% of all parking lot light pictures shall be turned off no more than one hour of close business. Um, just was kind of a point of just a, a, an interesting part of the conversation during the hearing about, oh, you want to put on all these lights at night, you know, from a safety perspective. Well, um, when is your business open? You no, know, it's multi-tenant business, different hours of operation. There was some, you know, some stuff to wade through for the board. There. Um, I think just maybe taking a look at the intent of the, the lighting regulations, see if there's a way to carve out something, um, or, you know, saying that's not the intent of the regulations. The intent is to make sure those lights are off at night. Um, so I think, you know, just um, taking a look at that there. And board members, anything else to add there? Does, does, does having lighting actually, I mean, do we know it prevents crime? Do not have an answer for you. I'd be curious, you know, because I hate lighting, so. Um, I, I think it's widely accepted. Um, there's a whole school of planning called SEPTED that I'm familiar with, which is crime prevention through environmental design. Um, lighting is among them, but also like, where are you putting your bushes? Where are your trees? So there's a whole like 
as a planner or a plan reviewer, there's a whole lot of stuff you can do or think about that a lot of us are not thinking about. Mm. Um, I'm not aware of too many people actually including that into a set of regulations because it can be really cumbersome. And um, So I, I think that the belief is there. Um, somewhat common sense that people are less likely to do something directly under an overhead fluorescent than... But it, darkness, could, but it could be a motion <laughs> thing, right, too? Yeah, I look at this, and part of what I'm also thinking is, you know, who's enforcing this? I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, the one that strikes to mind was actually way long ago for me. They are over on uh, Brentwood Drive, mm -hmm. way right on the Milton border, right? Am I thinking of that? Yep. Right? Yep. So we've got a bunch of industrial areas up there, and some of the businesses are in there. And um, we had a... a a nice couple in here who were establishing a, a, a business in there, just kind of like manufacturing mom and pop type stuff. Um, and the woman was really unhappy that the lighting had to be turned. This was forever, so this is not current. It's already in there. Mm -hmm. But she didn't feel safe having the, and they submitted a whole lighting diagram with the lumens and all that. And, and uh, but she w had wanted in the winter specifically for the lighting to be able to remain 100% on for you know, past business. Because their business hours, they were, they were manufacturing. They were really, they don't have, anyway, um, so it, it, whether or not it actually does, it, there's a safety issue, I think, to a certain extent. But I'll just mention Because with any building, I would think people can, you know, manufacturing, oh, you know, a fire alarm goes off or something goes off, like they're, you know, there's people in and out, even after business hours, I would think. It's an interesting one. I didn't even know it was in there. I've never seen it. Yeah, I mean, this had come up most recently, actually, in the fourth, um, which is, you know, a mixed-use area. Um, mm -hmm. And this decision is closed, so we can talk about it. But um, it was one where, I think, actually, during the hearing, um, a member of the public was happy that the lights would be on at night in some way, or at least later in the evening. Um, but, you know, regularly in the planning and zoning office, we do get calls from people who are um, looking for help because their neighbor's lights are on at night. So, you know, it's, we hear both sides of it. Um, so maybe there's a compromise here, or, you know, just something else that um, mm. can be done just to, so we're getting the desired outcomes here. But it's also a huge topic. <laughs> What's the main concern um, is it light pollution? Is that why it was written? There was a time when that was. It definitely, I was part of an Act 250 deal, but that was a problem. They were worried about the lighting straight down, mm -hmm. making sure nothing was bleeding out anywhere. I don't know. I, I think it's a good discussion. I think with the crime rate up everywhere, more lighting's better, most of these commercial establishments especially. Grocery stores, some of them have very dark corners these days from some of our lighting. Mm -hmm. And they have, we have had problems. Oh, I would love to have the light, my street light turned off. <laughs> so I can sleep at night <laughs> without blackout. <laughs> That's just yeah. Yeah. No, one other interesting. Thing, the board is well trained now. They heard a presentation from um, you know, somebody requesting the 80 foot tall light towers. Yeah, that, was cool. mm -hmm. that was quite, um, I, I learned a lot about spread of light based on how high they're mounted, so we could really dive into quite enough. Before you think it was like a manufacturing, there. it was a sports field. Yeah, no, it, it, it was really cool. Like the technology is, is like sick, it's awesome. Um, yeah. Totally this wasn't like. Now. And they, I mean, they, the things they could do, it was like, it was like a magic trick that they were showing. I mean, it was mm -hmm. very cool. It depends on what sports arena they're illuminating that particular com that company. Who's the yeah. light contractors giving us? Yes, that? if it's soccer, yeah. <laughs> 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 makes sense. Got all the good stuff. Yeah. All right, and the other item here under Article Ten, just to round it out, um, is under landscaping. So give me one more second while we get to it. <laughs> So, 1004. Native. There. So, 
under 1004E landscaping plan, um, you know, generally most landscaping items are very straightforward with development review board. There's a budget requirement. Um, that sometimes there's stormwater requirement. Um, so mitigating stormwater on site, an applicant, an applicant might include plantings to do that. Um, but one item that was pointed out somewhat recently was under landscaping plan. There's a requirement that plantings in the LS1 and LS2 district, as well as the Shoreland Overlay district, shall include a variety of primarily native plant materials mm -hmm. informally arranged in naturalistic groupings within <laughs> landscape areas. And I think one thing I heard with the board um, was reviewing an application against this standard um, was that you know, they didn't really know what to do with this language, um, just related to assessing whether or not, you know, the landscaping provided met, you know, anything to do with a variety of primarily native plant materials um, and informally arranged, you know, obviously you don't want it to look like a manicured landscape area, but, you know, there might be some some more specificity needed here. And obviously you've got the Lake Shores three and four districts too, so it might make sense to include these there. Any other endings to add from board members? That looks like a compromise <laughs> sentence right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We they're big on uh, natural, but you're right, it's pretty vague. I mean like majority native plant materials might make sense. And yeah. It is something that, you know, we can as staff review a landscape plan against. Um, yeah. No invasive species. Yeah. <laughs> is there a list? Native yeah. plants? That's, that's the other idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As found on blah blah blah. <laughs> <laughs> the state has lists of native plants. Yeah. 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 There is? Yeah. Yeah. So the realist the real issues there, the naturalistic groupings. Yeah, in <laughs> informal <laughs> arrangement. <laughs> informal It's vague. <laughs> no tree bingo. <laughs> no. Yeah, and I think also, you know, with these Lakeshore 1 and 2 districts, some of them are pretty far from the shore um, and might end up proposing landscaping that includes other species um, not even visible from the lake. Um, so just trying to understand if the distinction is, you know, to keep native plantings at the shore line, um, you know, if that's where the planning commission wants to go, I think the board is totally behind that. Um, but understanding that there might be other properties that get pulled under this regulation um, that might not have that as front of mind. So it leads to interesting discussions. Get it out of my head. <laughs> Someone had mentioned right during during the during that session specifically that they, is this closed? This one closed. Yes. Okay. Good. They could just drive by in a van and just like <laughs> chuck plants on the lawn <laughs> and drive away. That's informal. I want to give that person credit. <laughs> but I, I did bring that up. I can't get that vision out of my head. <laughs> so we'll have more discussion on this one. Yeah, I think, you know, yeah. some clarity, I think, would definitely help the board in yeah. um, reviewing yeah. It's, it's important. No, it's right by Bayside Park. Yeah. It's right across from the park. <clears throat> it's one of the ones, so there's a couple that have been turned into little, little like, big hotels. So not yeah. hotel, but like mm -hmm. a, a, um, Airbnb or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those. So. Okay. And I believe that one in particular was one that had gotten in before the change in the hotel and lodging that the planning commission has undertaken in supplement 44. Four. Yes, 44. So, so that won't be allowed in future because it's four units? Well, I don't have the thresholds off the top of my head. Do you know that I want to talk about? For an inn? Yes. 
ten. Six. So it's so it's an in. It's not a four unit four unit residential. Yeah. I've got to read up the the the, the, the most substantive change that was made was to to put a cap on the top end. Previously, it had been like sixty units could be considered an in. Didn't even need the word holiday in front of it. <laughs> 60 units was an in. Um, and as part of the last supplement, the Planning Commission brought that down to 20 units um, to be an in uh, because inns are allowed in quite a few uh, zoning districts where a hotel or motel would not be. I think the, the idea is an in is understood to be smaller, more intimate, um, and the definition just wasn't matching up with that. So I don't know what the minimum number to be an in is without having it maybe four six four um so there's a new definition of in that didn't exist prior or, no it existed we just amended it it was not a new definition oh six sorry at least six yeah um okay that one's not six yeah And maybe in three years we'll be circling back to this one and you guys will say, six, who are you thinking? Four is a perfectly fine <laughs> in. Talk about it then. Yeah. We're getting so many. I think the idea of six, by the way, is just so that you didn't have an Airbnb calling itself an in, but really all it did was divide itself up into four little units, four kitchens that they've put in and called themselves units. Mm -hmm. Six is a, is a harder thing to reach in a unintentionally yeah. that concludes my list that being said anything else mm -hmm. thank you yeah thank you Dre yeah. <laughs> um, and so we did talk about this being annually but that does not mean that this is the only time to flag things Zach and I are in constant communication probably much to his dismay as I stand in the doorway saying, Zach, Zach, Zach. <laughs> so um, board members, as things come up, relay them to Zach. We work through all supplements. Um, I talk through all of them with him. He knows everything the Planning Commission's doing. Um, so if you ever just read something in the paper or in the agenda and you're like, what is this? He'll always know. And if there's anything else you want to pass along, it doesn't have to wait for the annual meeting. Good. Good. Yeah, I can't thank you guys enough. I know it's an extra meeting during the month, but very informative. You know, it used to be this was all one board, and mm. since we split it, communication is <coughs> primo. I mean, to find out these things that we put in we thought were great and don't work, <laughs> and how to fix it is a benefit. Yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah. No, we appreciate it. I mean, and you guys get a, totally a mulligans for all this stuff where it's like we. You know, reading it, it's, it's, you know, you guys really are doing an excellent job for the community, and it's what makes Colchester such a wonderful place to live in. But, you know, the circumstances will evolve to tease out the little, you know, nuances here and there. And, yep. and you know, being able to, to close those gaps is good. Mm -hmm. Anything else from anybody? We're all good. I just, I, I just have to say yep. this, and I know it doesn't have anything to do with probably our boards, but I, I am so disappointed about the sailing center leaving uh -huh. Colchester, because I feel like that was just a really uh, unique resource that we had, and you know I just don't know if there's anything we could do to kind of prepare for that, you know, happening like like you said, maybe have a fund or something for these, you know. So I don't know if that would have helped. If we had some kind of fund where we, the town could have bought that property, but that, that's just a shame. Yeah, you know, that's a big part of the bay is those sailboats. So that's just my two cents. Right. We don't need to figure it out now. <laughs> Do we need a motion to adjourn this park? Um, I, I guess we did adjourn the adjourn the joint meeting, and then I would also recommend that you, um, you know, schedule it in maybe a five minute break. Is that, Absolutely. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Would you like to? Oh, okay. Then I make a motion that we adjourn our joint mission, joint meeting, <laughs> the review board, and the planning commission. A second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 We adjourn. It was nice meeting all of you. Thank oh, you yeah. again. Yeah.
So we are officially back on meetings at 8.31. Discuss, discuss draft amendments to the Colchester Development Regulation Supplement 45. Okay, so you guys have all seen the agenda. I'm going to click on the attachments. Um, we'll make it bigger. So what is new since last time? Not much. A couple of important things I want to highlight though. Um, because we are getting close to warning a hearing, as anybody who's been through this process knows, we have to, uh, we are required to do a report, we call it the report, to the Department of Housing Community. I have affairs in here, it is development, DHCD. Um, and that is now attached. You did not see that before. It's pretty short for a supplement like this. Sometimes it'll be a lot longer. Basically want to know that you're not, I've referenced this before when you've had some requests that say, hey, we want to completely rezone this. And I say, that's not in conformance with the plan. And the report will ask us. Um, so this has asked us, are you in conformance with your plan? Um, that's attached here. Hopefully everybody's read it. And this one's pretty short. Um, so that is new. Um, also new, um, we talked at length about a draft definition for degree of encroachment. That's been updated. I'll get to that in a minute. Don't worry. Um, that brought up a whole discussion, some of which started here in this room, about footprint. We did not define footprint. Appurtenances, also not defined, um, although we always had a list every time it came up, such as Hopefully this will shorten that up a little bit. And then there is a definition for building footprint. Um, but if you read that, that is not at all the definition that you were talking about in terms of footprint. It's really intended, I think, largely for flood zone stuff. Um, and so we just did a quick update there, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover all these in a moment. Um, so these are what is new since we talked last. The other thing that's new, which hopefully is handy because you guys have watched me scroll and scroll and scroll through 300 pages of regulations, I've included a summary sheet for you here, which um, plugs those things into, I'll come back to this memo, hang on, okay, um, supplement 45. I made you a nice little index. So for anyone seeing this for the first time, here's just a little key about what strike through means, what underline means, why do we have some red, why do we have some blue. Um, um, and then um, why do I have some highlighted in this summary here. So um, I have that just so that you can see the text that relates to each of those four letters, A through D, um, and how they're categorized. So I won't go through all these, you've seen them before, but most of these, as you can see now in one place, are just to show where those chapter eight changes were made. These are all under A here, update and real that. So almost all of them aren't really substantive to the extent that they just talk about getting rid of those connections to chapter eight. Um, if you want me to slow down at any point, holler at me. But there's nothing here new that's since the last time we talked in this section here. Um, so, all of those in blue. And then if you want to see the actual text, I've given you the article and page. So if you want to see it in context, you can go there. Um, so I'll scroll through those quickly. Those are, that was the bulk of the amendments. There were a lot of those, but they are pretty much all the same. Uh, letter B, K 
conveniently in a new color. Green is everything that we talked about for our site plan applications. Those look like they're a lot. I will remind you that that's a, because a lot of it was moved. When you move text and track changes, it makes it look like it's deleted. Um, but really they were just relocated. The substantive change was about um, adjoining landowners and how they are notified. We talked through that, nothing has changed. Um, so the references are all there. I didn't put them in directly because they're long and they're just strike throughs that have just moved text. Um, quick changes that are still included here is this notice requirements. That's new, that's, that's supplement 45, not new since our last conversation. Uh, next section was the language about setbacks from public infrastructure. As a reminder, these are the pieces that the Department of Public Works staff has asked us to include in order to reduce conflicts between private, above ground, temporary structures largely, and below grade public infrastructure. So don't put your construction trailer or your porta potty right on top of our water main, it'll be a problem. Okay, so that's what's in yellow. Looks a nice golden up there. It is a very ugly yellow on my screen. Nothing in there is new since the last time we talked. Okay, now we're getting to the part of new stuff. Gray, Article 12, okay. So, um, I want you to see this. I'm gonna pull this also up in, the summary of new stuff is here, but I wanna remind you that the reason that this even came about is because there is a section in 703 that says you can't increase the degree of encroachment. Okay, so you can't increase what? You can't increase this thing that's here, the degree of encroachment. Okay, what is the degree of encroachment? So, oh, I spent a lot of time with this one. So this is what I have to present to you. It looks wordy, let me walk you through it. Um, the, so we wanted to make sure that when we talk about the degree of encroachment, we are talking about two measurements. That linear distance within that 100 foot, as well as how much stuff you have in that 100 foot, okay? Um, should I illustrate? I'll, I'll hold on. Um, so we say the linear infringement, so you cannot increase the linear infringement into the lakeside zone so lakeside zone as quoted here is the same language the state uses to refer to that 100 foot. So that's where lakeside zone comes from. That is that 100 feet. So you cannot increase your linear infringement into that 100 foot by the closest point of the existing non-conforming primary structure. Let me draw that out for you. argument this is 80 so the linear infringement means you have some point in your house at 80 nothing you built gets closer than 80 no matter how much of it we're talking nothing gets closer than 80 I think that was already widely accepted even by people with the most liberal definitions you're never going to get closer than 80 so then the next question that comes up, so we get past the linear infringement. Then we talk about the square footage of the footprint of the same structure within the lakeside zone. Okay, so let's just say you have a thousand 
square foot structure here, 800 of it is in that lakeside zone, lakeside zone. You don't get more than 800, whether you shift it, move it back, you don't get more than that. And we talked at length about, um, what does it look like if that did that, right? You don't get to build that out. Make sense? This is this is what we talked about last time. So I think we there was very um, good consensus about what we meant to say. It was what is the right text that says it? Okay. So the square footage is 800, right? Square footage of the footprint. And this is where we're going to circle back to footprint because this was part of our conversation of that structure in the lakeside zone. So footprint. That's a deck. It's not 800. 780 because 20 of that's a deck. Footprint. Okay, Kathy. What's a footprint? Footprint, newly defined. The area, and part of this I just want to tell you, um, if it looks a little wonky, you're like, how the heck did you come up with this? We have this dictionary of, it's actually really handy, it's called like, It's something like the Blue Book of Development Definitions. It's something yeah, like it's widely accepted nationally. Um, so we looked there, and part of this comes from that, although we adjusted it for ourselves. Uh, so the area encompassed by the structures, I think what it had said is outer wall, we added foundation wall um, for clarity at ground level, excluding appurtenances. So, footprint. I'll let you think on that for a minute. Because we spent a lot of time talking about this. Should you say as appurtenances as defined here? Mm -hmm. It's not there defined. Really a part of them, I guess I don't have to reference it. Before we move on from the degree of encroachment, though. The linear infringement is a little confusing. So if I were reviewing this. It, it is. You have to really, there was no simple way to write it other than to keep putting the words back into the replacement form. So we wanted to say is you can't get any closer, but because the way that the shoreland text is written, it says you shall not increase this. So it's almost like having these double negatives, right? Um, so we, we want to say is you can't get closer, but that's really hard to fit into a definition. So the linear infringement means, the linear infringement means how far into that zone you are. So you can't increase how far you are in. Yeah, I understand it because yeah. you're explaining to me to, you're explaining to me now, but if I yeah. were reviewing it to help someone. It's a mouthful. Yeah, I don't know if it would help if, if uh, water word, like linear water word, like it's what closest to the water, you know. It's that line or area that's closest to the water. Linear, that's horizontal. You, you know what I mean? Like, so is it the linear? Is, is linear the word that? Yeah. Okay. Linear. Um, I don't know if there's something else. Yeah, I think what we're trying to do with linear is to separate that from the square footage, like the, the area versus the perpendicular. Mm -hmm. It's probably not the best word either. The intent, maybe there is a better word, but the intent is to separate it from the square footage infringement. It's the, it's the, the linear one, <laughs> but I think having a does, diagram does, helps. Does perpendicular help? Perpendicular does help a little bit, but I think the diagram, <laughs> a, a, a good diagram would help. Yeah. I, 
would go to Kathy to have her to explain that to me. <laughs> so yeah, I'm open. Yeah, I know. It's not awesome. But it's, it's so... I apologize. I took a bite of a cookie at a time when I was <laughs> Sorry, then I called most. on him. Such a um, jerk. Initially, when um, Kathy Ann and I were working on this definition uh, to propose to you all, um, we realized that we needed to address the linear portion of this, that structures can't get closer within that zone. Um, and I, I'm struggling a bit with the perpendicular. My mind may, might not have been there, but <laughs> well, can you explain the perpendicular word to me? I, I don't know if I it? like it. I can't defend it. Okay. <laughs> well, it might be. Degrees. It might not be perpendicular, yeah. though, depending on the way yeah. the house is situated or whatever. That footprint could be yeah. just at a corner, so the perpendicular might not always be applicable. I don't and know I, if there is a way to put in a figure to let people know exactly what we're referring to. And one thing we were trying to avoid was putting a regulation in the definitions. Um, you know, definitely not wanting to hide anything in there. Um, hmm. What about... We have an appendix that just has a bunch of diagrams, right? Mm -hmm. I believe it's B. B. Um, so there are a bunch of helpful diagrams in B. So a diagram could get slotted in there. Um, the tough thing about that, though, even though I think it's a fantastic idea, you do want to consider um, this is ready for warning should you want to do that. I don't have a diagram ready. You would have to delay that warning. Um, short of me drawing one up right here, which just, I can, I can change a lot of text, but I can't give you a drawing tonight. Um, which is fine. Um, that would just push everything back on our schedule. So we can circle back if you wanted to do that. Um, I didn't well, if we schedule. don't, if we can't come up with a better definition, it ends up best definition we have. Unless somebody has a better idea. Uh, we kind of have a definition that limits how much you're coming in to beyond that input mark. The linear. I, I read it. I thought I could understand it and the square footage. Those would be two important things. At least we have something in there. Yeah. And if we have to improve on it later, if, if the DRB finds that they don't understand it either, then we come back and address it. But at least we have something going forward. And I think you could, Zach, slap my hand if I'm wrong here. Um, if they warned this draft or some version of it tonight for the public hearing, at the public hearing, they're entitled to make changes. So we could include a um, diagram. I just can't, you're, you're not allowed to consider it until, I can't circulate it amongst you or anything. You could consider it at whatever date you want a public hearing. So we could plan to do that. Mm -hmm. You yeah. just can't warn it as part of, you can't include it as part of this one. Everybody's not yet? Yeah, yeah. Good for that? Good. Yeah. yeah. All right. Still thinking. Oh. I, I only, um, so it would be a change to a different part of the regulations that hasn't been warned. So it would include a new bullet point under this, or not a new one, but under this it would be, you know, the sections that have changed and then Appendix B as well. So I don't want to, um, get us into a false start situation. Right. Yes. So you can make changes to warned items, but that would not be a warned item. It's not explained. It's a very good one. So if we 
come up with something different than linear, we could bring that up at the hearing and possibly change the that at the hearing. If you don't change the meaning, would you change the word? Is that possible? If something comes up better. So... Do you think this drawing does it? Put a few words on it. <laughs> you like you well, label. You gotta label, label the lines, AD but as yeah, yeah, with linear some infringement. <laughs> right. So okay. Is the issue with linear that you just don't feel like it's it's perpendicular to the lake? Is that the issue with linear? For, I feel like it could mean a few different things. Yeah. Because um. you're, you're looking at the point that's closest to the lake. That's your that's your point, right? Correct. So you just don't like the word linear. I don't love it either, but I can't think of another good. Right. Yeah, I can't think of an. Un <laughs> it's a substitute, unfortunately. Wow. Uh, but if we're seriously considering adding a diagram. If we can, if we can, then it would have to be the next round. So I was talking to Pam here about using distance. The problem with that is you want to remember we plug this in to you can't increase something. If you say distance, you don't want to say you can't increase the distance because you want them to increase the distance. Um, the, uh, you don't want them to increase the infringement. What infringement? Infringement is just another word for encroachment, really. Mm -hmm. So, I do like the idea of um, picture. Kind of what I'm thinking about doing is actually drawing one out for you guys to look at tonight. That's what I was <laughs> going to say. We could we could put that in right here. Uh, so, whatever diagram B, and this is diagram B. And that's, that would be good to go, correct? So we would, let me just make sure I'm getting a good collection of everything we have to do to make this happen tonight. We would have to, um, everywhere where the list is, we would have to add item E to say Appendix B. Right, updates. Because that's, that's where our images lie. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to update the report as well. So I'm, I'm keeping track of this because this is what you'd want to put in your motion. Right. Um, Can they amend D, which is currently says new definitions including, and then change that to be updates related to defining shoreland degree of encroachment, including changes to Article 12 and Appendix B. Sorry, you no could, but at that point, E is just, it's not right. work. Yeah. If we're already going to change everything. Mm -hmm. um, so this is in the warning. In the report. In the summary. Uh, most of which is fine to just put in your motion, um, but you do sh you should see the photo or the the, the image. So, um, is this all we have? Okay. Um, Rich, how do you feel about a five minute cupcake break while I get my cramps? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody on board with that? That's, that's the question now for us is do we want to change this for that linear? Have Kathy put this together? And then we put in our warning tonight with these changes, or do we go with what we have? Or you could just, just take it out. Being, but I don't, I definitely don't think anybody here wants to take it out. Or you could hold your February meeting. It just pushes everything back by about two weeks. So let me just quickly go to... What the, what's the concern? Is it that the public like someone applying for a building permit, wouldn't, wouldn't you explain it to them? I mean, mm -hmm. so 
I'm just well, trying to think what the problem is. I do think an image will be helpful for everyone. Yeah. I, I do okay. think it's a great idea. Okay. Whether or not it's... Okay. Critical. I just don't want to see us rush the supplement with these little pieces and then we miss something. No. Yeah. We did that through COVID once already and I do not want to get invested into that again. Oh, no. And you know I'm, I'm very careful about this stuff. I don't like to... I know. Um, I don't know what happened to my... Oh, there it is. Okay, let me scroll down the bottom here. I have no problems with the picture if you're confident. But if, it, if it's a concern personally, I would say I would take this and move on because like everything we, you know. I could draw you a picture in about five minutes. Yeah. I think it's very basic. We just need labels and you need to actually see it and it has to be the same thing. We could edit the photo once we make it. Okay. Could bring you a cleaner version, but at least okay. if you have something that you have approved okay. in concept where there's no substantive changes, okay. and you approve that part tonight, All right. you know, I could take a hand drawing of the same thing and turn it into something with a little more finesse. Straighter lines. Straighter lines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I could get you All right. very close to that in about five minutes. All right, so we need a motion to uh, take five minutes. Oh, okay. I'm going to make a motion that we take a five minute break. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We have five minute break. Anyone have a question? Yes. All right. We're back in session. So now, where are we at now? Okay. So everyone has had a chance to review the drawing. We're on record. The drawing represents what you would like to include for the warning. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. We will get that in there. Okay. Do we want to return to definitions or are we. Yep, continue where we're at. Uh, I don't think I briefed you on the last part of the footprint, so. Correct. Let me quickly pull that up. Like if you do, 
Um, it would mean likely not having a meeting on February 7th. We can determine that later, but we would not be able to hold a public hearing any earlier than February. And put the 23rd there again. It should be the 21st. Hmm. I don't know why I have the 23rd on the brain. I know why. I leave for vacation that day. <laughs> I was wondering about, I was wondering, it's a Thursday, right, the 23rd is a Thursday, I'm like, why? January 23rd is on my brain, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm so ashamed, I'm not going to so, be going somewhere outside, <laughs> uh, so February 21st would be the public hearing, with plenty of time to get that into the newspaper, if you hold and close your public hearing on the 21st, that would allow you to deliver that um, on March 14th. Um, now again, there is some wiggle room here if you weren't comfortable tonight. We're not talking about a delivery of the supplement to the select board until March 14th. So theoretically, um, you could, without messing with the timeline, have a public hearing on March 7th. Um, but I don't think that sounds like it's necessary. Um, March 14th, delivered to the select board. Uh, the last time you did a supplement, the select board really heard the bulk of everything informally that evening, went through everything, warned a public hearing immediately, because um, of course they may not, but this is what they've done most recently. Um, if they do that um, and warn that public hearing right away, that would be held April 11th. Um, which aligns very nicely with the wastewater regulations, which would um, change April 1st. Um, and then, I guess I didn't include this here, but if they hold their public hearing on April 11th, it would be effective, fully effective. Um, That's a 21 day effective date. So it would be effective by early May or late March. Early May. So. All right. That's what that would look like. The motions I provided you have been updated here to include your updates tonight. We separate the adoption report that tip of that technically will be sent to DHCD from you. You are the authors of that, and that is why you are required to put on it. That adoption report, as per your vote, will say that that would be amended to include ID. And because it's not at all substantive, there's no changes to any of the parts of the report. Where the report asks you, um, is this in compliance? There's nothing actually being added other than illustration. So I wouldn't change anything other than to update the list of amendments. No other text changes to the report. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. So are you saying you're not going to add? I am Oh, I am, but only from the standpoint of, scroll down to it. So bring this up so you know what I'm talking about. Oh, I got the 21st right there. Mm -hmm. um, so the only update to this will be to add Uh, this was fixed after this, by the way. I do have this posted correctly. So it says ABCA. Um, I did since fix that in a different draft. It would be ABCDE. E would be this new figure. But the rest of this, there would be no changes to. Okay. Everything here on this second page would remain the same. Okay. So we're ready for a motion with necessary changes. 
correct? Um, I can show you the motion. Yep. That I would recommend. It is your motion, of course. Feel free to amend as needed. Whoever is making it. Okay. You ready? Um. <laughs> Okay, I make the motion to accept the amendment and adoption report as amended this evening to be included in the public morning and distributed accordingly. I second that motion. All discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Scrolls again. Thank you. Okay, I'll make another motion. Yep. All right. <laughs> Make a motion that we warn for Planning Commission public hearing on February 21st, 2023, the proposed amendments to the Colchester Development Regulations, known as Supplement 45, and as reviewed and amended the evening of January 17th, 2023. The amendments would include adding item E to, list, to the list of amendments, which will add to Appendix B the figure illustrating the degree of encroachment definition. Second. Second. All right. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. All right. The last item is to quickly take a look at your meeting schedule that we were just in. Um, because you have to make a decision on whether to hold February 7th or not have a meeting. Skip. 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 <laughs> there you go. Because that's your regularly scheduled meeting, I would, I see no harm in making a motion if you're okay with that. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I make a motion that the next meeting of uh, February 7th that we do not meet until we have the public hearing on February 21st. Second. Second. Second, all right, there we go. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Okay, so on the 21st, we can discuss the rest of this. This is just so you have it. Um, the last item, I think, on the agenda. Will you be able to send out those new dates to us? Do we have more new dates? I feel like things were moved around a little bit. Um, no? Is it just the 21st? I could send you something which confirms the decisions you just made not to hold the meeting on the 7th. So I'll send you no, the I, actual I, dates. I get that. I just okay. didn't know if we had moved some of the March and April meetings. Not no. yet. Okay. I'm okay then. Um, so included in your packet um, on item 9, South Burlington Land Development Regulation. So, um, <laughs> Our report had to be amended, but at least we did it. Um, you'll see that there's an email. Um, South Burlington has their own updates to regulations. Um, they forgot to notify abutting towns. They've already held that hearing. Um, but I think it's important to still have it. Um, I like to read it. Sometimes there's cool things worth stealing, borrowing, or saying never, ever, ever here. Um, nothing really stood out. We do share a border with them. This is extremely tiny. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing in this set of amendments that would have any effect on Colchester. Um, but as is my practice always, I share them with you in case you find them of interest. I don't recommend any action on it, but if you want to, um, you can file a statement with their planning commission. File a statement? If you don't like something, you're <laughs> if you want to provide public comment, I guess I will say. Oh, okay. Although at this point, I guess it would go to their council because... Sure. Yeah. Thank I'm you. not aware of you guys have ever, ever done that. No. But... We're probably still good. It's an option. Yeah, yeah we're still good. We're good. Still good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Minutes of January 3rd, you had in your packet. Yeah. yeah. A few interesting typos. Mm -hmm. Oh. Second page. 
Uh, one, two, three, the fourth paragraph down. The last. Uh, are you getting it up or? apologize for the quality of these. I tend to talk so much that I don't write. And then I go back to my office at 10.30 at night and I try to do them. Oh, I know you so. do usually do a very good job. <laughs> it's just some of this uh, which I think was uh, not caught, that's all. Okay, which page would you like to? The second page there. Okay. The second, pa second period paragraph on the bottom where it starts LaRose. Uh-huh. Okay. LaRose presented several scenarios. Anyway, robust member discussion resulted in unanimous direction that the staff interpretation is what is and should be intended. That no new additional square footage should occur within the 100 foot protection zone and under it should be no circumstances? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Should any new land development occur closer <coughs> than already exists on the parcel? Is the rest of that okay? No. That paragraph. That paragraph. Okay. The second paragraph. After that one. Um, the next paragraph it says members were in favor of language that would allow full rebuild of an existing structure, and were clear that the appurtenances that were not approved, non-habitable living space such as decks, overhangs, and porches could not be converted, in this case, to habitable living space. So they should be saying non-habitable, or? I think what I was trying to do is apply the not to both words, but if that doesn't read correctly, we can rephrase it. Okay, I see what you're doing, okay. That we're, like, that we're not approved and not habitable. Yeah. But if that doesn't read clear. Yeah, I do that. That were not approved or we could just get rid of habitable altogether. That's probably because I'm not sure habitable is really what we focused on. Sure. I don't even know if we have a definition of habitable. It's true. <laughs> Would you be okay Define. if we just removed habitable? Yeah. Yes. Does that still yeah. capture the essence? Yeah. Okay. That was that was it. Just, just make sure he's saying what we want to say. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Motion. Make a motion that we approve the minutes from the meeting of January third as amended tonight. Second. We'll second that. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Aye. Now we need a motion to adjourn. Oh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> I second that. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.